the doubling uh, of uh, um, the lectures between uh, this one and of uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Lagoyanis. But uh, at the beginning, of course, you will see again those uh, schemes of transitions and so on. On the way, I will try to give you in your hands some tools. Most of them are, some of them are available online for free. Uh, unfortunately, Gupix that I will show you at the end, it's a commercial program available from University of Guelph, Canada. And if you will do Pixie in, in your career, for sure you will be acquainted with, with this uh, software sooner or later. Okay. So this is the outline of the talk. I will just tell you something about the physics. Not to, uh, I would say, torture you too much, but to understand why we are doing something in this energy range, what's going on, and so on. And then I will try to be as fast as possible and going further for the detector. Uh, some, some detector demonstrations, some, just few aspects. It's just one hour. Then we, do, we will see some Pixie applications, again, very specific, uh, connected to my expertise. And then something about the future. What kind of uh, Pixie we will do and what kind of detectors we will have in our labs in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, the future already started. I will show you some examples. Okay, again, uh, the process responsible for uh, detection of X-rays from a target when you irradiate uh, with protons is inner shell ionization. And then, in the second step of the process, inner shell vacancies, so after the electron is ejected, these vacancies are then filled with outer shell electrons. And then you have a series of so-called characteristic X-rays. And uh, they have quite strange notations. These are still used, although they are historical ones. Later on, atomic physics developed much more exact notations, but we uh, conservative uh, people are still using old notations why alpha, why beta. First, they saw the strongest lines, for example, in copper. And then when they improve a bit the spectrometers, they saw there's another bump, roughly 20% of field there, and they name it beta, and so on. So K means that the vacancy is filled from uh, in a K shell, L that vacancy is filled uh, in L shell, and so on, and M, and, and so on. And here, at least we can see that, uh, in addition, when the photon is emitted from an atom, that's, uh, a, if you do some quantum mechanics, operator responsible is, elect is electrical dipole moment. And this transition should obey uh, this uh, nature of this dipole moment. So you see, from L0, to L0 from L to K, there is no transition because the change of L should be one. That's the rule of dipole transition. Okay, then from perspective of a theoretician, how to treat this thing, it turns out that physics is quite gentle. To a very good degree, we can separate these two process is an almost independent one. So first, you treat ionization. And then you get atom in some strange state with hole inside, uh, some, some hole in, inside. And then another second step process is uh, filling the inner shell. So in this treatment, we can do most of physics required for PIX evaluation. And again, the same scheme as before, but now where to look for it? Well, I, I check on the online, so this X-ray data booklet will provide you with mo most of the things you need in your career. I will try to skip for a while from there and just show you how this document looks like. 
Oh, let me see if I have also a web page for you. Okay, if you will look for it, you will find it on the web. And now let us see uh, how it looks like, what's, what's in there. Just a moment. Where is the... That's approximately, uh, we don't see it. And strange is that I will need to. Uh, let's see if this one will, sir, will, will. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what's with this projector. It should be done to see it. I checked many things, but didn't check this one. He is not, let me just see. Yeah. Anybody knows how, what to do that he, you need to drag the window to the, to the left or to the right? Yeah. Ah, you think so? Let's see. Probably, yeah. I'll tr I will try to enlarge a bit and uh, at least, okay, what's here? A lot of, a lot of X-ray data. And for you, what is important, if you will work with pixel spectra, X-ray uh, emission energies. Usually, we keep these plots somewhere next to the processing PC or whatsoever, but it's online and uh, you can always access as a new generation. You don't need to have uh, it in the paper form. Okay, mm, let me just see if I can showed you something in this document. I'm really sorry for this. Strange. Okay, X-ray emission lines. Ah, it's gone. I don't have it anymore here. So probably uh, you will deal with, you see something? I'm so sorry. Okay, I don't see it at all, so. And you, let, let me see. Oh. What I can do, just a moment, let me just see. If I can, no, it's Murphy. We will, we will simply continue with the presentation, and uh, hopefully you will get. If somebody wants the address of that file. If you not, will not be able to access it, you can even write me email. Okay, so the beam is coming to your sample, and let's uh, uh, consider that the sample is thick, so we will consider general case what is now going on. Protons, at first, they are stopping in the matter, as you know. Stopping power is there, so the energy is going down along the way through the material. All along the material, there is a probability to ionization, and X-rays are going out. So if you have a detector here, you will detect X-rays. What will be the yield? If your detector will be very big, you will detect more of them. So that's described by this factor, which is solid angle. So so-called fraction of total 4 pi, because if photon is created here, it uh, has no preferred angular distribution. Has, as I mentioned to you, it's a two-step process, no memory of the ionization. So photon can be ejected in any direction. So your solid angle of the de detector over a full sphere around, then it's, if you have two times more protons coming, your yield will be two times 
bigger, so that's number of protons. This is Avogadro number, and here it's also important what you have here. Detector doesn't see all of the photons because you cannot make infinitely, uh, you can actually detector that would go from zero electron volts and up, but a uh, photon should enter into the sensitive uh, volume of the detector and part of the spectra is cut off. Efficiency, I will, uh, sorry, gods of technic doesn't like us today. Okay, hopefully at least there. I will show it there or if not. Okay, so efficiency of the detector. For example, you have X-ray of five kilo electron volts. Uh, some detectors will see like 80% of all the photons because in front of them, they have some absorbers or vacuum windows. And then sometimes we deliberately put additional absorbers there. Sometimes we cut part of low energy spectra away. If you are interested, for example, in uh, metal ions, let's say copper or something higher. So there's also described as initial absorber. And there, there is very important quantity, probability for production of X-rays. Inside you have ionization cross section plus fluorescent yield. So not every vacancy we were speaking before is at the end decaying by emitting a photon. There are other alternative transitions and decay of these inner shell holes. Uh, one, maybe you heard about it, is Auger transition. And then you have also Coster chronic and so on. So here we describe so-called production cross-section for X-rays and it's uh, a slightly different cross-section, smaller than the ionization cross-section. And of course, when the photon is created here, it must reach the surface and undergoes absorption from the creation up. And this is, as you know, it's exponential fall of the numbers. And here in this exponential coefficient, this is an additional complication of the, this calculation. All the composition of metrics is present. So to correctly describe absorption from the position of production out of the sample, you need to know exactly entire sample. So things are getting complicated. And one step is that you take into account stopping factor, production cross-section, and absorption, and do integral from a zero energy to the final, uh, to the initial energy of the proton, and you got a special factor called tick target factor. And then we had actually with this managed to cover two complex things. First is stopping of protons inside the target and absorption of the X-rays coming out. And now the yield is a bit simpler. Again, we have solid angle, number of protons impinging on the target, this Avogadro number. This is efficiency and absorption in front of detector, and here is this tick target. And you see, now the yield of element with index i is proportional to the concentration. X is concentration of element i. And his, this is molecular mass of element. What is now the trick? What is now the problem? If uh, if you would have just a thin, very thin layer where there is no stopping and no absorption out, we can do it by hand. We are trained physicists, most of us, and we can uh, do this calculation by ourselves. But as absorption here on the way out and the stopping here are functions of all the constituents of the sample, things get complicated. And I, we will see it later. We will try to do this for a metal alloy in a simulation. You must allow your calculation to iterate. You assume at the beginning a bet matrix, we call it matrix, that describes stopping and absorption. And what you see in the spectra, you say it's there, let us evaluate and assume very bad matrix. 
you run through it and then say, okay, I can estimate now how much copper is in my target. And you put better result in and that computer is iterating. And finally, if you have enough information for him, he will give you proper concentration. Okay, let's see if this guy will show us something more. Not really. See? Mm. Let me see if I can do anything against it. Okay. Now, what is very important, I always ask my students, you are from time to time, most of us are very lucky. So you got new accelerator. Every generation, maybe once or something. And for example, in Itemba, South Africa, they got three million volt tandem. You can make six million uh, electron volt proton. What energy would you select for optimal pixie? You have now anything from one up to, let's say, we don't run to 100% usually, let's say five, to, from one to five MeV protons. If we look for the cross section now, you see it here. For iron, very important element in pixie. If you are, for example, at about 2.5, you reach around roughly 130 barns. If you go to five, you see here, you reach roughly 800 barns. So your yields will be much better. So from this first uh, instance, you would say, if I can do five million volts, let's go for five million volts and do pixie there. Usually, if you go through literature, you will see that in the last time, most of PIXA is done roughly at 3 million volts. If uh, labs can do it, if they have seen it and it machines, sometimes at 2.5. Do you know the reason why 5 is not so much desired? Anybody would guess what's the problem at 5 million volts? I don't know. Yeah. A lot of them. And what would happen with your spectra? Your uh, silicon detector or SDD or what, every detector would see a lot of gammas. Actually, not their photopics, but a lot of Compton tails. And your, if you, in your spectra, whatever spectroscopy you are doing, your background is high. And you have very small yield. Or if you can trade this, no background and even smaller yield, what would you select? Lot of background and reasonable yield, or no background and let's say five times smaller yield. What's better in the detection mini limit sense? Many times without a background. Background is a problematic thing. Uh, it, it provides you statistical uncertainties along your energy range, and uh, you need to have roughly three times the sigma of the background to say, okay, there is a peak. And if your background is zero, you can do already with 10 counts at least identification that something's going on there. So that's why Pixel community prefers a bit lower energies where detectors don't see too much gamma, uh, Com Compton tails of gamma, gamma radiation. Ah, that's annoyance. Let's see. Let me just see. Okay, let's try. Okay. Now types of X-ray detection detectors. Community in the last decades uh, you was traditionally using so-called C Li detectors. So these are silicon detectors with drifted lithium. We will see how the crystal looks like in the following sl slides. However, in the last decade, a lot, uh, a lot of 
has changed. Silly detectors were very slow detectors, so you need roughly 10 microseconds to, I would say, to uh, digest the pulse. Collection of the charge when the photon enters the diode is slow in that type of detector. And uh, this was main constraint, actually resolution. Uh, anybody knows how the resolution of X-ray detector is defined? At which energy and how you would measure it? If you are buying detector, they would say you... 433 something, no? They would say you 140 EV, oh. something like this. And then what, what does it mean? So if you would irradiate manganese with your protons, you will see manganese K alpha line at 5.9 keV, and then you go to full width of half maximum, and that's your resolution. Well, very, the best detectors uh, today, they can do, let's say, 128 EV, something like this, but standard 140, 150. And uh, if you want to do it with this resolution, with silly detector, you need nitrogen cooling, and again, it's a slow detector. Now, silicon, so-called silicon drift detectors are taking over, and they are very fast. So instead of 10 microseconds to digest one pulse through your electronics, collect all the charge, and process it into pulse head distribution, you need only one microsecond, which is essential difference. You can do much faster pixie with, uh, with it. That's how Old silly detectors, good guys still in operation in labs all over the world look like. Here is Dewar, and then you have here Cold Finger. Just to show you how they do, I will not, uh, where is it? It's there. I will not show, uh, I don't have destroyed X ray detector, but I have something very similar, that's what, you can push it around, that's what, in the dewar of the cousin of uh, silly detector, that's used to be germanium G lead detector for gamma rays. So you will see a copper bar that actually cools down the crystal, and also uh, we cool preamps, part of preamps, uh, the, the, the fat usually, uh, the transistor. And now, how you would, let's see how a uh, silly detector looks like by determining its efficiency. And then later on, I will show you the alternative silicon drift detectors, which are now. You must actually do efficiency calibration for any detector and the process is very similar. So, when you are buying X-ray detector, please be very pushy. Manufacturers should give you all the details. They don't like to give the details, for them it's a trade secret, and if they hide it, then you are in, in a big trouble. You, it will take you a long time to figure out how to describe your detector in your Pixel setup. So you, you need to know how they made, from which material, the electric contacts, how thick are the electric contacts in front of, of your detector. What is the dead layer, typically? Is there internal collimator? I will show you how important is internal collimator later on in the Gupix uh, feed. Usually, it results in parasitic peak. You are happy, you discovered, I don't know, we will see nickel in your sample where nobody saw it before. You figure out that, for example, zinc K, K photons excite uh, uh, fluorescence in your collimator, and you will see a wrong element in your spectra. You must be very aware what is in your detector. And if vacuum window starts to leak, slowly you can get not water but ice layer on your crystal. Crystal is very cold, and all the moisture in your vacuum chamber, if the vacuum window is leaking, will end up as a small ice layer on your crystal. And if you are careful, sometimes you can get rid of it. 
if you are not so lucky to get rid of it, at least it's important to take into account to describe the efficiency appropriately. That's how now a bit more detailed uh, image, uh, what all you need to consider when you're describing the layers, even in GUPIX, in your evaluation program. First is usually beryllium window, or now you can get uh, already polymer windows. So that's the first layer where part of photons will be absorbed. Beryllium is the, I would say, the lightest compact material able to withstand the pre pressure difference of one bar. You have here inside vacuum, and you have here usually atmosphere or vacuum, depends what kind of pixel you're doing. Then you have, as I mentioned to you before, possible ice layer, then you have gold contact, and then immediately after the, after the, the gold contact, you have a thin dead layer. Actually, it's silicon there, but this silicon does not absorb X-rays appropriately. So it's like an additional absorber there. And of course, then you have it also on the back, but this is less important. So again, it's part of an efficient and also another contact. If you will want to see the physics of transmission, this is where to look for. All the community is going to this home page. Let me see, uh, but I think I'm without internet here, so let's see what I can do. Maybe just uh, to show you the first page of the... Uh, let me just... Let me see if I will... Oh, do we see it? Again, not, huh? I will try to bring you into your side just a moment. Okay, at least something. So, it will not work because I'm without internet connection, but at least you, you can see. You can in your own. Uh, later on, maybe. I, I don't. So, you enter here formula. For example, for beryllium, you simply type beryllium. Density, if you leave it minus one, he has it in his own records. Don't need to care about it. And you, uh, you put, for example, you're interested in absorption from uh, 10 EV out to 10,000, and he would drive you the, the, the file in 100 steps. You can do it in 500. And then you just submit request. Very useful homepage, and uh, if you will uh, look for X-ray detector, you, there is, for example, 25 micron beryllium window in front of it. You check how far down you can come with the uh, sensitivity. You can go up to sodium for sure, even with 25 uh, micrometers. But usually, uh, if you are really focused on very low energies, you, you take either 12 microns of beryllium or a polymer window on your detector. And it, we, on this home page, you can calculate how much photons, for example, of sodium, uh, what fraction will be transmitted to your detector. Whether you will see 10 or 40% of photons, this is quite important for the detection limits. Okay. Let me just... Uh, one question. Yes. You, you make those calculations in order to buy... Uh... No, in order to understand, in order to select, in order to predict, you need to discuss with producer what options he has. And he will tell you, I can, oh, it's full fancy, I will give you ultra thin window, and you want to measure from three kilovolts and up. You need high energy detectors. Say, no, no point. Better to take 25 microns of beryllium, which is very robust, yeah. you will not kill it, and so on. 
So if you want to measure sodium, you will see that uh, that's, uh, uh, if you will take, for example, polymer window, you might need, if you have visible light conditions, you will need to have light block also there. So all these things should be considered when you are buying, and this is a good tool. Yeah, to but at the end of the day, you, you will calibrate it, right? Yes. You are not going to trust yeah. in your calculation. This, this is estimation how much photons you will detect. This is based for your, your selection of the detector. If you would like, if you like to measure, for example, sodium with it, then you need to really consider carefully which of the vacuum windows that producer is offering you will select, and so on. Yeah. Just see how to get rid of this guy now. Mm -hmm. I'm also almost blind. I need to duplicate. Is this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so. If you would now, now uh, take the data from, from the home page I showed you, you see each of the layer has its own absorption characteristics. These, ju uh, these rapid jumps, j uh, jumps, you know where they come from? Anybody would guess? Why it's not soft curve? It is in transition that you... Yeah, if you, sure if you reach K edge of some uh, ionization edge of some element, there the absorption will have a drastic jump because if you give just enough energy, that the electron will jump out from the shell, there your absorption probability will be higher. And that's how you see it's like a, on some places like a rapid jump and this is actually the, the L or K shell uh, ionization energy. And then when you consider all this transmission of all the layers we showed before, then this is finally your transmission of your detector. If you described it quite well, then you take set of micrometer thin standards and check what kind of job you did. Micrometer produces evaporating standards on polymer foils, and that is for f ideal target I was mentioning before. You can assume no energy stopping in the thin layer, and there is no absorption on the way out. From pixel methodology, this is thin pixel sample, and then these are certified values, and that's if you did this job very carefully, what you get, and you see, Sometimes it's not exactly there, but not far. So this, what we see here for us, we are from our lab with such characterization is very happy. There are some problems. For example, here you see titanium. Big discrepancy. What's, what's with titanium? Anybody has some instinct? What's wrong with titanium? And they evaporate you elemental titanium on your target. What would titanium do? It's a getter material. It all their dirt in their vacuum evaporator. So they do use quartz balance to measure how, what is the lateral density, but it's not just titanium there. All the residual gas and dirtiness in their evaporation machines. So that's why this is the most problematic standard for, of micrometer. Titanium, you can buy standards also from European NIST. IRMM, and you see there is, they still have some problem, but they have cleaner vacuum chambers for evaporation, so the, the discrepancy is much smaller. Okay, at the, in the end you have spectra like this, and uh, you feed them, and you check the residue. We will see about the residue later. It tells you something that where uh, the areas where you don't have everything well described, if the residue is too high. And then you got your 
concentrations. Okay, we see how silly looks like. Let's see the new technology. This is silicon drift detector. Why it's so much faster than silly detector? Actually, electrodes are not front and back, but you have these concentric rings where the voltage is slowly increased along the way. And now, if you create electron hole pairs, they are drifting another direction. They don't go front back, but they drift along this, and then they are collected by these sets of electrodes. And you have also, this is uh, silicon uh, integrated uh, circuitry technology. They will do also integrated FETs on the chip. So if you f feature some problems with your detector, you don't send such thing to, to the uh, producer and ask him to check your preamp or something and uh, replace some FET transistor ion preamp. Why? Because they're integrated there. What they do? They screw the, the crystal away, they, uh, throw it, put a new one, and they will charge you almost as for a new detector because that's the heart of the detector. You will pay 60% of the price of a new, no serviceable parts on it. Again, another, another uh, sketch. So X-rays are coming from here, and the electrical charge carriers are collected here in the center. Now, when you will buy, it's very important also what kind of geometry they will make for you. I'll try again to show you just recent work Okay, now you see it. <laughs> we, are, we were trying to see the X-rays before, the energies, and uh, that's how the, the tablet looks like. Where is it? Let's see if we can. Okay. Okay, I'll try to enlarge some place, parts of it. That's just a fresh, we're buying new X-ray detector. I wanted to show you this experience. So, producers have different size of crystals. Roughly said, bigger crystal, bigger solid angle. You must be careful. You pay a lot of money, end up with the same solid angle. You see, this is the sketch of the sample. Your beam is coming this way, just next to the snout. You can approach, because it's on a movable slide with vacuum bellow here, you can approach to very close, and you will cover 0 0.36 stradia with a small, 65 square millimeter uh, sensor, which is collimated to 50 square millimeters. You should not use the edges of the crystal, just the central part. And then they have available also I'm quite slow anyway. I will just show you this. Uh, you see? They, they offer much bigger crystals. This one is 109 square millimeters collimated to 80 square millimeters. You are again approaching here. You pay much more money, but you see the solid angle. It's smaller than this one. Worse res uh, resolution, because bigger the crystal, lower the resolution, and you pay roughly uh, 10,000 more for the detector. So what's the point? The encapsulation is not very optimal. So this is your, this is your uh, crystal, and you have a lot of hardware, a new useful one next to it. So here, if you buy, that one is a choice. But then you go to this one, extremely big 
crystal, 170 square millimeters, collimated to 150, you will pay probably 40 or 50,000 for this detector, but at the end, if you do this geometry, you cover more than half of the steradian. This angle is really huge. Everybody who was working with these coaxial detectors was dreaming about availability of such detectors, and now I just got these sketches with the offer. So it's very, very, I would say, tempting to, to get this thing into your lab. Will you share this as well? <laughs> you can get it. OK. Let's continue fast. Also, a new development, probably the fastest uh, pixel detector in the world is Maya development by uh, Chris Ryan and his colleagues in Australia. So you see it's a very big chip with annular aperture. Beam is coming through annular aperture. And then uh, you have a lot of segments here. And each segment acts as an individual uh, X-ray detector. So they can cover really not only very big solid angle, maybe just two times bigger, bigger solid angle than the one I showed you with coaxial geometry, but count rates can be on the order of 200 times higher. So they, they can do on synchrotron facilities uh, count rates of a few hundred thousand per second. So spectra in mapping mode are coming very fast, thanks to this development. OK, now I will do very fast uh, some applications. We usually do at home with MicroPixie. And I will pay attention that I have 10 minutes to show you a Guppy case. Just five minutes, very fast pass through applications. So this is uh, the lab you will see tomorrow. I usually work on MicroProbe. That's how you form it. Maybe you heard about it, two pairs of, uh, pairs of two slits. And in our case, triplet with uh, quadru magnetic quadrupoles. And then your chamber is very close to the, these optics in the focus of the magnet. That's how the chamber looks like. Once you have microprobe, you equip it with a lot of detection if you have space, because in our acquisition system, we have eight ports. And uh, we do in so-called event mode. Your acquisition system is waiting that something has happened in any of these eight detectors and saves the energy of the event, number of the channel, and position where the beam was at that moment. Can you tell me what is the distance of the target from the last protocol? We pushed it um, closer than Oxford. Oxford, I think, is 18 centimeters. We went to 14.5. Uh, Point five. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And uh, another question, if I may. Uh, you said one by one micron, but in that case, you have quite huge current. Yes, I will show the optimal case. Yeah, we can go sub micron. That was just uh, roughly the uh, optics. That's how this station then looks like. You see, this is still old Sealy, and this is Ige, uh, both uh, low energy, high energy detector. Later on, you see it on this side, this is already silicon drift detector, so no dewer anymore. And this is the best we can do. We, we uh, use focused ion beam, low energy one, to mill the standards. And uh, you see these are, uh, this is 16 times 16, this is 5 times 5 square millimeter frame. And if you, if you check the beam size now on these edges, it's roughly 600 times 700 square nanometers, and current is 200 picoamps. Uh, not many labs can do this, uh, especially uh, labs need, need also very bright sources. Uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Lowry, uh, got it recently. And also, all our colleagues who have single-ended machines have even more bright sources than uh, we do have. So, we can do PIXE if we do everything optimal. We have a space to do it in sub-micrometer lateral resolution space. 
Okay, and then you have uh, biologists coming, doctors coming, a lot of work for them. I'm doing this for the last 15 years. And it's quite, uh, I would say, quite interesting work. Uh, why they don't go to electron microscopes? Because you put a sample in it, and what would they would see? Huge background. This is Bremsstrahlung, electron Bremsstrahlung. And as protons have much higher mass, this is main contribution, you see a lot of small pixels there. So we are roughly three orders of magnitude. Our limit of detection is lower than theirs. And that's why biologists who have, for example, they bring you a grain of wheat, three cultivars, which one has more iron in it? And iron is in the level of 100 ppm. Nobody will be able uh, to do it with electron microscope. They come to pixel or some other topic. OK, you need to process. This tissue preparation protocol for pixel is quite complex issue. Uh, you, you will see it uh, uh, on the slide. Uh, and uh, we can discuss about it later. So now I mentioned several detectors. They're all waiting on events to Pixie. We measure, we measure the thickness of uh, the slice of the tissue. We measure light elements with uh, electron backscattering. And then we also measure, we have in-beam rotating chopper. I will show you next hour how we measure how many protons goes to the sample. And then when you measure, you have there, you put discrimination limits in your spectra, and you got such rough maps out of it, just to know that your measurement is unfolding well. You see a lot of different elements, thickness, profiles, everything is there in life, and statistics is getting better and better. OK, just an uh, uh, example. I mentioned with grain. They are really interested in trace elements because it's very important for us to get zinc and iron from bread because this is our staple diet. And if you cut the grain, this is quite interesting shape. This is map of phosphorus. And you can do two times two millimeters, but you can also zoom. You will see to individual cells. These are individual cells in seed envelope. And then, for example, uh, I'm a tea drinker. A lot of tea is produced on uh, soils which are full of aluminum. I always uh, was asking myself what, uh, what the hell I drink every morning. And uh, tea, tea with spiked tea with, with, with special minerals. And I will show you where that minerals are, are accumulated. Aluminum is of concern in human diet. You see, aluminum, where, where are you? Here. You see, this is cross-section of a tea leaf. And you see, all aluminum is in upper and lower epidermis, very low concentrations in between. Even tea plant doesn't like it. It comes with other minerals in it, and then it puts this into the epidermil, epidermis. But if you zoom, this is. You see very strange feature. These are sing single layer of epidermal cells. And you see that where you have, uh, for example, potassium here, there is a hole in aluminum. So actually, plant is so clever that it doesn't kill epidermal cells, but somehow pushes aluminum between the cell membrane and the cellular wall, where it's an active space. And uh, that's uh, a story of aluminum in uh, tea. Uh, sorry, how, how thick are those samples? These samples, uh, we cut everything from 10 to 50 micrometers. It depends what you're looking for. If we look for cadmium, which is spectroscopically extremely difficult, you need thick slices. But you will lose cellular contrast, because one cell is roughly 10, 20, 30 micrometers. If you would like to see individual cells, then better cut slightly less than diameter of the cells. You will still see the cellular wall of each individual cell. OK. No, this is in vacuum. In vacuum, in vacuum, yes. Dried tissue, on, according to special protocols. OK, additional. Thing is that you, if you have such individually grown cells, 
it's astonishing that you can scale how much particular mineral is individual cell. I will just show you an example. These are human cells grown on, on very thin foils. And this is just example. We, uh, we did uh, hundreds of cells on different uh, cultivation procedures. And for example, this cell, after the evaluation, you can tell your doctor or biologist it's 3.3 .3 picograms of potassium and 21.1 of gold nanoparticles in picograms, extreme elemental sensitivity. And as again, these are when you dry these cells, they are thin pixel samples. Quantification is quite simple because there's, you can check how much absorption is there, but you see the absorption is very small. And stopping through the cell is also very small. OK, now the last thing we, we did, uh, I, I'm, I was very proud presenting this on, also on the IBA conference because we see because of the paper at the end. But proteins are very interesting thing. You imagine biologists know exact composition of protein if it's contained uh, inside 10,000 amino acids, they know exact sequence of each of them. For us, for me, this is, it's really impressive. But then I was shocked. They were asking me, can you measure whether we have in this perfectly known protein two, three, four centers with zinc? I said, what? Ask me again. We don't know how much zinc is in. How do you don't know if you know 10,000 amino acid sequences? No, we have no technique to determine it. And then this is uh, the thing that Jeff Grime uh, started in the beginning of 2000, and uh, we were following his way. So what's also very nice, forget about all those normalization and everything. The easiest thing is if your sample has a substance that you know how much is it in that we call it internal standard. And purified proteins have internal standard in it because among 20 amino acids or something, you have two amino acids that contain sulfur, methionine and cysteine. And you ask them, yeah, if I, if I would get from you how much sulfur is it in, I can do it for you, otherwise I have no idea. And they tell you immediately. They know all the sequence of amino acids. So internal standard is always there. And then life for us working with pizza is trivial and simple. So we ju just apply solution on very thin foil. We are using 100 nanometer thick piolophorum. We suspend several droplets on it. Measure the spectra. You see the sulfur. In our case, you see golden ions. You see zinc, which was pollution. At the beginning, they couldn't purify this protein, for example, very well. Should not be seen there. And that's how the maps look like in microprobe, because you, you call it coffee stain effect, when, where all the material is transferred to the edges of this droplet. This is roughly 1.5 millimeter big circle that you analyze. And you can check the thickness. You can extract for your map spectra just from the thickest part and so on. See, this is thin. You check how much you thin the sample. Uh, oh, we, for example, we were running 20 hours on this one. Thinning is not there. So we don't evaporate anything from proteins. And uh, at the end, we provide for a special protein containing uh, 24 rings how many gold atoms are there to be bind this buckyball made of protein rings together. This is so-called synthetic protein. Very interesting uh, cage which you can open, close, just by changing the pH in your solution. And uh, it just in, in May this year, we were, uh, finally got first paper in Nature, which is, for our group, really a success. Future of Pixie. Just one year ago, I was opponent on a PhD thesis in Ivaskila, where they have one of, I would say, five uh, arrays 
of with TES transition net sensor arrays. You have series of small gold blocks in this array, and each of them is kept in this transition between superconductive and normal state. And now imagine you put, you, you hit this golden block with X-ray and as heat capacity at such low temperatures is so small, you really heat up with a single X-ray that small block and because of this, these blocks start to, to jump on this transition edge going up and then with reverse cycle you push it back and you measure how much you need to push it back. That's it. That's the principle. Electronically you must push it back to again to this state and then you get the fantastic energy resolution. Pixie we are doing with 140 EV I mentioned to you. You can do pixel with this detector at 14 EV, 10 times better. But what's the point? Because the, the minimum difference that you're going to have is the difference between two elements that are one. Network. One thing is that you resolve interferences. Another is that if you, sometimes you have so-called chemical shifts that can be in a matter of even two, three electron volts. And if your resolution is like uh, 10 or 15 electron volts, you already see the, sh see the shift of energy because your element is in particular chemical state. You're slowly getting to the place where you don't do just elemental analysis, but also chemical analysis. We are all dreaming about <coughs> such detectors. We have one detector that is able to do this, but it's a big of the, the, the like five seats together here and you cover really extremely small energy range with crystal Bragg diffraction. Here again you see what is the edit value. One spectra in one shot. Maybe, yeah. Just a comment on that. We just acquired in the Cybersdorf VWDX detector that has resolution of few tens of electron volts, like 40, something like that. And that does the entire energy range. Yeah, you so have mechanics can, in that. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. Somehow, you know, anyway, uh, I think uh, when I was student at the university, Professor Knoll, I was privileged, came to our place and gave a lecture. And he said, it's a question of few years when everybody will work with these detectors, with s superconductive detectors will rule the world in the next decade. Now I'm getting old, almost, uh, it's almost 30 years since then, and these are the first detectors that do the job reasonably, and they are very difficult to maintain. But anyway, time will make it sooner or later. And now, let me take five minutes break for everybody, and I will prepare Gupix, uh, small Gupix run on one of the files, okay?